They coming with their dad to get some dirt. Say, get some dirt. Nigga here, say get some dirt. Get some dirt. <laughs> some dirt. Hey guys, how you doing? We at Sweetwater State Park today. Um, I forgot what event's going on, but um, something dealing with something my wife is part of, so. I'm take you guys along the journey. What's going on, boss? Nick, nice to meet you. Yes, sir. <laughs> We, 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 we don't, we don't come out here. Victoria. Victoria, this is Nick, my husband. Victoria is the vice president. Nice to meet you. Right really. Early in the morning, yeah. yeah.
right guys, so what we are in front of right now is called the Mill Race. So the Mill Race would have actually been constructed around the time of the mill in the 1840s. And it basically would have been used to channel water towards the mill, which would have powered the mill because the mill was powered by hydropower. So basically utilizing the resources of Sweetwater Creek to power the mill, which then would have produced textiles. So that basically means they weren't making final products like full outfits or final products like tents and stuff like that. They were just making the cloth itself. But the water would have run this way. They basically diverted it away from the creek to take it directly to the mill. They also would have used this mill race area to transport goods. So if they needed something like lumber, um, stone, anything like that when they were building the mill or after the mill was constructed, they would actually have to transport it down the mill race using rafts. So they would put things on rafts and basically float it, made it a lot easier than having to carry it yourself or using a, wa a wagon drawn by oxen, which would have been kind of like the main way to transport things around this time. So it's a pretty neat invention and you can actually see behind me they still have a lot of the stones that were originally stacked to build the mill race itself. Alright, so back in the time of the mill's creation in 1845, what you would have had is you would have had to bring in a lot of workers at the time to basically work in the mill. So these are people who were trained particularly in textile making. So they basically would have known how to weave or they might have known how to work the machinery or something in the textile mill. And at the time, a lot of the people that worked in the mill also lived here. So it was basically a system where they kind of kept everyone in debt to the company that owns the New Manchester Mill. And so the people that worked here also lived on site, but their housing was owned by the owners of New Manchester Mill. And they also basically got everything they needed for their homes and for their lives from a general store here on site. The general store was also employed with people from the owners of the mill. And so anytime they would buy something like clothing for their children, dry goods, grits, beans, stuff like that to eat, basically the way it worked is it was in a credit system back to the mill owners. So it was basically the system that kept these people in this area and kept them working in the mill and basically encouraged them to not be able to go anywhere else and find work. So that's basically kind of how the system worked. And then their houses actually would have been in this area kind of on the hill and around us too. And then the general store would have been three stories and it actually got busted during the Civil War because supposedly the three brothers who owned the general store were also making shoes for the Confederate Army in the basement. So it got basically raided and burned to the ground. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it's your first time out this? See the water.
Yeah, never hurts. That's why I kind of let myself be the barrier between you guys and us. Yeah. Not that they're going to do anything, but you know, it never hurts. Alright, so you are now standing in the New Manchester Manufacturing Mill. So back in its heyday, it would have really been most productive around the 1850s. And it would have been one of the tallest buildings in this area when it was constructed. So it's pretty neat because a lot of the materials to build this were actually either made here or gotten locally. So the timber was from trees that grew around here. The stone was quarried locally. If you guys came in on the interstate, you probably noticed a lot of stone quarries on the way in. And then the bricks actually were handmade too, primarily by enslaved people, and then put on the banks of the river to dry and harden. So pretty much everything here is from the same area, so it's probably for Douglas County. And then it was hand built, which obviously you can imagine it took quite a long time to complete. And back then we didn't have most of the modern conveniences that make building things a little bit easier. So any things you had to transport, you put in a wagon that was carried by oxen. Any of the stone work, the masonry, anything like that had to be done by hand. So it was a lot of work, but it would have been five stories back in its heyday. And I want to go show you guys one more thing, so we'll kind of walk this way. Yeah, this, one, this is a whole bunch of them. I mean, it'll be just like squish and above, except. Hey, accidents do happen. See, but I, I already knew that you were full of jokes. Oh, <laughs> Dang, people used to. People used to come to work here every day. This is good. Nice come over here. And they lit the basically all the mill on fire. 
It went up very quickly because like I said, it's basically just a giant lint ball. And you have wooden floors, which also went very quickly, and the wooden wheel, which is obviously no longer here either. So they were kind of bored. They were here for a couple days afterwards. Basically, they had arrested and captured all of the mill workers, charged them with treason, and were awaiting orders to figure out what to do with them. So while they were here, they actually did a little bit of graffiti. So behind your head, you can see the letters APG, DHC, and CV. So this is what we call Civil War era graffiti. And you can tell it's from the 1800s because of the flourishes on some of the letters, that nice kind of fancy V, the little M's on the D. So we can tell that this is from the period of the 1800s. If you look at some of the more modern graffiti, which is obviously in here too, unfortunately, it's kind of like chicken scratch. So this was actually from the period, and we actually know the names of those soldiers too because they graffiti in another area. What? No, he was looking at the beer can. Uh, yeah, yeah. Beer. That's probably also modern. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, so we'll move in here and take a group photo and then I'll kind of wrap up and tell you guys what happened to the mill workers. Okay. Honey, they, Davidson. Yeah, so we saw that APG. Do you guys remember that from earlier? Mm -hmm. So he really went crazy oh, come in here. On. So we put A, P, and then we know his last name was Gilbert. And then the other one, Davidson. Harley Davidson. <laughs> yeah, the founder of Harley Davidson. Great, great, great grandpa. <laughs> <laughs> no confirmation on that, but we can speculate. So I was going to kind of finish up. We can go out here. I just wanted you guys to see oh, this. Thank you. Mm -hmm. But I know that nobody wants to be cramped. Guys, basically what happened to the mill workers. So to give you a little bit of backstory, at this time period, around the 1860s when the bill was burned down, the mill workers primarily would have been women and children. Why do you guys think there would not have been any men? Because they were at war. Yeah, they are at war, right? So most of the men are fighting for the Confederacy or not fighting and hiding somewhere so they don't have to fight for the Confederacy. But most of them are not around. So basically most of the mill workers at this time are women and their children. Back then there's no child labor laws and they actually liked having children working because a lot of the machinery, when it would break and stuff like that, children are very small, they could crawl in and try to fix things. So pretty rough. Not working easy days either. You're looking at 12 and 13 hour days, basically working in a textile mill. So not really a great life for these people. And then, to top it off, they get arrested and charged with treason. And Sherman had a strategy about this. So previously, about a year before, in Louisiana, he had also burned down the textile mill. But at this time, he had let the workers go. He released them. Basically said, like, just go on your own way, you know, do whatever you want but they found work at another mill in the area, which then went on to produce more goods for the Confederacy. So he had kind of learned his lesson with that, and he arrested these people and charged them with treason. And then basically they waited for about two weeks kind of trying to figure out what to do with them. Because like I said, you don't want to put them back in the same area. They could find work for someone else. So instead, he transported them 16 miles to Marietta. And they didn't have enough wagons to carry everyone, so some of them actually walked the 16 miles. And then once they were in Marietta, they decided to send them north because there weren't a lot of textile mills up north. They had better control of them there. So they basically sent them north to the Ohio River and just put them out. Unfortunately, a lot of these people never figured out what happened to their husbands or their fathers or any other family that they had in this area. So it's not like you had a cell phone, you didn't have a car. And most of these people were pretty low income. They didn't own property. They didn't own a lot of possessions. So basically, once they were turned out, they had one thing that they were good at, which was textile manufacturing. And where they were turned out, there wasn't a lot of textile manufacturing in the area. So a lot of them, unfortunately, lived pretty sad lives. Some of them actually starved to death because they weren't able to find work or food. And then most of them never, ever came back to this area. And there's some good accounts of kind of their personal stories in the visitor center when we get back, if you feel like reading those. There's some good ones. But yeah, any these, questions for me? Are these bullet holes? Yes, they are. <laughs> so the mill actually was not gated and protected until about the 1970s. So the Georgia Conservancy really helped us basically kind of manage this property and turned it over to the DNR. Before that, it was just kind of like a local hangout spot. So a lot of people would come in here and shoot it. You know, they'd hang out with their friends. So yeah, they used it for target practice. You can see all the holes right here in the wall. And then. Yeah, can you tell a little bit about. Yes. Yes. And how do those rooms get their equipment? 
that's a great question. So uh, that was kind of my fun trivia to end with. So this movie, or sorry, this movie, this mill has been used a lot in movies. That's kind of like what we've been famous for. And as you guys know, Douglas County has had a lot of good income come in from the filming industry. So famously, where we were earlier, where the wheel was, that kind of entryway that goes towards the creek was used in the Hunger Games. So there's a scene where Gail, uh, Katniss's friend, and she go hunting. And then they come and they sit in that archway and kind of have a moment and talk to each other. And then that's probably, I would say, the most famous movie that's been filmed here. There's also one called Killing Season with Robert De Niro and John Travolta, and they use the mill. Recently, we had the uh, show MacGyver, the reboot of it. They filmed here. They did a campfire scene in this area. We shared a clip of it on our Facebook page. And then probably the most famous thing we've had recently was the Falcon and Winter Soldier mm. on Disney+. Plus. Mm -hmm. So they released that episode a couple weeks ago of them filming here. <laughs> yeah. So it's great for us. We get a lot of nice income from it. Um, and I mean, it's cool to be able to brag about that to other people. But yeah, so to get stuff here is kind of obviously not very easy. <laughs> and it's pretty amazing. They will actually run a bunch of generators. And you'll see cables like all the way down the red trail. Mm -hmm. And they set up these things called boom lights. It's basically like a huge lighting pole, kind of like what you see at like a baseball field. But they'll set them up like around the mill to create light. Sometimes they film at night and they'll use stuff like that. It's it's pretty nuts. Like if you're ever here on a filming day, which we just had two recently, a Netflix show last week and then a Paramount show for me. So yeah, it's pretty neat just to see like all that goes into it. There's tons of stuff. And they'll put like big stuff up. Like someone didn't like the fence, so they covered it with like this green screen kind of stuff so they can edit it out. And then if you're really rich, like Disney, they actually basically paid us to take down the entire fence. And then we were like, yeah, you can do that if you put it back. And so they did. They put it completely back after they filmed the Hunger Games. So. Wow. Or Falcon Winter Soldier. They got that money. Yeah. And they bring in props and stuff. The MacGyver people had a big campfire scene here. So they set up like a fake campfire. Are those palm trees being no, so we did a big restoration effort in 2017, so the concrete beams are new, and then if you look in the windows, there's metal plates like beneath some of them. That is new. There's some new masonry on the bricks and the bottom windows here. 